The next panel is on the recent substantive developments. Um, we've tried to distinguish between the, between the charter and the non-charter issues, and so this is a, a essentially a non-charter issues panel. The, um, again, introducing the panel from my far right is um, uh, David Humphrey, the firm of Greenspan Humphrey, um, Defense Council here in Toronto. Next to David is Gail Dobney, who many of you know, of course, from arguing summary conviction appeals in Toronto. She is the summary conviction appeals coordinator and naturally does a lot of this work in her uh, job. Um, next to Gail is our moderator, His Honor Judge David Fairgreave of the Ontario Court Provincial Division, uh, here again sitting here in Toronto. Next to Judge Fairgreave, Janet Leeper, who another defense counsel in Toronto. And then finally, uh, Rick Libman, who's filling in um, of, on very, very short notice um, for Rennie Pomerantz. Rennie uh, was hoping to be here, but unfortunately she's uh, got a jury out in a case and so she was not available. Rick has very kindly agreed to fill in since Rick has argued most of these cases anyways. He knows all of the law in this area and we appreciate it. And just one uh, a technical or, or one announcement. Uh, Rennie's paper, because she's got tied up in this uh, uh, trial, was not available, but she's uh, going to deliver it at some point in the next little while, and it'll be sent out to people to, uh, to people who have registered, and so eventually you will get the uh, Rennie's paper. Okay, David? Thanks, Mark. I think we all recognize that the most interesting issues that arise in the context of drinking and driving cases are the charter issues that have already been discussed by the first panel, but there have been a number of recent substantive developments in the law of drinking and driving, and I think if counsel are going to properly defend these cases or properly prosecute these cases, counsel have to be aware of these developments as well. We recognize that we don't have enough time to cover all of the so-called recent substantive developments that we might discuss, but we're going to try to identify at least some areas where developments have been made and where issues have been raised which leave some scope for argument by counsel. The first is, is the meaning to be given to the term impairment. And I'm going to ask um, Janet to assume this fact situation, which perhaps isn't an altogether unusual fact situation. Suppose you have a case of impaired driving, a charge of impaired driving, where a police officer gives evidence as to the standard observations, an odor of alcohol and the breath of the accused, some vague reference to unsteadiness on his part when he got out of the, the vehicle, reference to bloodshot eyes, perhaps glassy eyes as well, and a reference to slightly slurred speech. At the same time, assume that there is no evidence as to anything remarkable about the manner of driving described by the officer. How does defense counsel defend a charge like that? Janet? Sorry? I'm here. Janet? <laughs> yeah. I, I think prior to the decision in Stellato, which is the case out of the Ontario Court of Appeal at 18 CR 4th 127, you might have tried to argue that that list that His Honor Judge Fairgreave just gave me fell short of a marked departure from, from the normal. And that phrase comes out of an old case called McKenzie from the Alberta District Court. And a lot of, a lot of us defending these cases really tried to apply what McKenzie described as looking at a combination of several tests and observations showing a marked departure from the normal, that is the normal sobri sober state that would then lead you to be able to say that person's ability to drive is not impaired. As a result of Stellato, it's, uh, it's my feeling that you can't, you can't use that phrase anymore, even though if you read Stellato carefully, you realize that Stellato was not necessarily disapproving of McKenzie. Stellato was really just making the point that there is no need to prove a marked departure in terms of the impairment. In other words, slight impairment is impairment. Moderate impairment is impairment. They will all result in a finding of guilt. But if you get into using that phraseology now, I think you, you could run into some, some trouble. So what I tried to do was looking at Stellato, try to find another way 
to essentially say the same thing and take the list of factors um, that were given in order to argue that that's not impairment. In Stilato, the, the court says this, which, which I found to be helpful. A trial judge must receive sufficient evidence to satisfy himself beyond a reasonable doubt that the accused's ability to operate a motor vehicle was impaired by alcohol. It is not an offense to drive a motor vehicle after having consumed some alcohol as long as it does not impair the ability to drive. It's really saying in, in a different way what McKenzie says, which is there can be some indicia of consumption of alcohol. That does not automatically mean that the person's ability to drive is impaired. And I think that's, that's the fundamental issue that you have to keep before you when you're arguing these cases. And when you're faced with the list, of course, you're going to go through the list with your client and try to cover off any other possible explanations for any of what you have. For instance, bloodshot eyes. I mean, many of these cases, our clients have been up late and they're driving late at night. So they're coming home from a bar usually. But they, <laughs> but they, they also probably haven't had a lot of sleep. Or they may have been working very hard that day. They may not have had much sleep the night before. You, and they may not necessarily tell you that unless you ask them about it. So in terms of dealing with the list, it's important, I think, to break it down and go through every possible explanation for why red eyes. Are there contact lenses? Is there cigarette smoke where the person was? Again, probably, if they were in a bar. And um, were they tired? Um, the swaying and unsteadiness, often there'll be an accident. And uh, you have to ask yourselves, well, is there an explanation for the fact that they were in a car accident as to why they're not able to walk all that well at the scene? So that I should mention as well that Stellato is under appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada, and there may be, there may be more said on how we're going to approach the issues of impairment. But uh, for the time being, I think uh, what we all have to remember is that to, to use this phrase, mark departure from the normal, that's going to get you into an area that's not going to be that helpful in making your submissions. Okay, well, I'm going to ask Gail, who's sitting right here, what the Crown's response would be to submissions like that from defense counsel trying to account for these so-called indicia of impairment. Well, actually, that, that is usually one of the defenses that, that comes up. And our answer has always been, well, yes, but we also have this consumption of alcohol, which is also consistent with all of these symptoms. And basically, the Crown's argument is, isn't it more consistent with impairment? And we're going to ask you to find, as a, as a fact of finding credibility, that all of the symptoms are due to impairment. And it's, awfully, it, it's usually pretty um, effective because you also often have evidence of the driving from the police officers and the weaving down the road and things like that, which often is the reason for the stopping. You rarely get on a, an alert stopping for speeding or something a straight impaired that's that easy to prove. And then you have to put together the symptoms. Um, so yeah, we, we tend to say, look, that's all nice. And yes, there may be an explanation here. But also, in each and every one of these things, the other alternative is impairment. And that's what we argue. Look, at this is because all of these symptoms are there. It is because the accused is impaired. The, the problem that we used to have pre-stilato, though, and I, I think Janet and I may differ just slightly on, on what we think this, uh, the effect of this judgment may be, is that by arguing these things, everybody would always come up with the marked departure from the norm test and say, well, a little bit of um, smell of alcohol and a little bit of weaving, all of these things don't really meet that test of marked departure. It's our argument now in the summary conviction appeals it is that the test in Stilato has, has almost lowered that, and that as long as you have proof of impairment to any degree. And, and the practical, people here will argue that the way the Court of Appeal looks at it, there may not be a difference. But the practical result in summary <coughs> conviction appeals has been on a marked departure test, they were more prone to allow an acquittal at a summary conviction appeals level using the marked departure test, whereas provincial court judges would convict on a degree of any degree of impairment. Court of Appeal, the summary conviction appeals court, would overturn it. Uh, the Court of Appeal may not see that distinction, but we lost a number of them on the marked departure test. So our argument now is that Stilato has cleared this up, that any impairment equals a conviction. And I think we may find we're going to be a bit more successful at the summary conviction appeals level at upholding the provincial court judgments. Okay, I'm going to ask Rick to consider this fact situation. Um, without going into great detail, assuming 
the not unusual situation of an accused testifying to a certain amount of alcohol consumption and the defense toxicologist giving evidence that based on the accused evidence, there's no way that the breathalyzer results, say 180 shown by the certificate, could possibly have been obtained, but that he couldn't say necessarily that the blood alcohol level would have been shown to be less than 80. Is that evidence to the contrary to rebut the presumption in 258.1c? The answer to that, according to the Ontario Court of Appeal in St. Pierre, by the majority of the Court of Appeal is no. It wouldn't be evidence to the contrary, but this is the subject of continuing debate not only in our Court of Appeal, but in other Courts of Appeal and the Supreme Court of Canada has granted leave on St. Pierre and incidentally they've granted leave to appeal on Stilato, the case that Janet and Gail were just discussing. The issue is whether evidence to the contrary within the meaning of that phrase in 258.1c is evidence which might merely show that the accused's blood alcohol limit is different from the reading in the certificate or whether alternatively evidence to the contrary has to be evidence that would put the accused's blood alcohol limit underneath the legal limit. And the Court of Appeal in the majority judgment gives the latter interpretation. They have held that it's no good. In other words, it's not evidence to the contrary to raise evidence that may, for example, cast doubt on whether your client had a 180 reading as opposed to their having a 150 reading. In the scenario that David gave me, it wasn't clear. In fact, there seemed to be an absence of any indication that the accused in that scenario would have had a blood alcohol limit underneath the legal limit, in which case the majority in St. Pierre says that no, that's not evidence to the contrary. Okay, Dave, is there a contrary view to be considered? There is, and I hold it. What happened in St. Pierre is that there was a high breath reading, but there was evidence that after the driving, there had been some consumption of alcohol. And although no toxicologist was called in that case, the trial judge found that the consumption of some alcohol after the driving was, strictly speaking, evidence to the contrary because it did, to some extent, contradict the presumption of blood alcohol level being the same at the time of driving as it was at the time that the test was taken. The trial judge felt that there was no reason for there to be more in the evidence to the contrary. There was no reason why the accused had to go further and show not only that the blood alcohol content at the time of driving was different than the time of the test, but further that it was, in fact, below 80. That would elevate evidence to the contrary to being evidence of innocence. And on a strict interpretation of the term, that's not required, in my view. That was the view of the trial judge. That was the view of the judge on the summary conviction appeal. And that was the view expressed by Madam Justice Arbour in her dissent. And as Rick has said, that matter is now going to be considered by the Supreme Court, and there's still some hope that that view will prevail. All right. I was going to ask Rick whether he had any sense of the time frame in which a case like St. Pierre might be heard by the Supreme Court of Canada to resolve this. But you don't have any idea? They granted leave in September, I believe, fairly recently. Okay. Have there been any other developments in this area of evidence to the contrary, Rick? I think there are a couple of things that you can look out for, and David does make some very valid points in terms of limiting St. Pierre. For example, there had been no expert evidence called in St. Pierre, so it doesn't address that situation. And I suppose the search that the police officer conducted in that case left a little something to be desired. Ms. St. Pierre asked if she could go to the washroom, and she emerged with two bottles of vodka afterward, which she handed to the police, and there was an issue of post-arrest consumption. So St. Pierre does have rather unique facts, and no expert evidence at all had been called, so you may wish to bear that in mind. 
bearing in mind, though, that the Court of Appeal, at least in majority, has spoken, what are some of the things you can look out for? I, I've made the uh, distinction between a case where you, you do want to call expert evidence, and I, I think you'll find that that's really where uh, most of these evidence to the contrary uh, cases ought to be argued. There seem to be a, a number of appellate decisions, not so much in Ontario, but they're reported um, in the Canadian criminal cases, Dubois it, by the Quebec uh, Court of Appeal in 62 CCC 3rd, page 90, Gibson, uh, 72 CCC 3rd, page 28 from the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal. There seem to be a a number of uh, appellate judgments that deal with the issue of the, the trial judge not really resolving the issue of the competing testimony, uh, where the, the trial judge will perhaps on one hand not specifically disbelieve the evidence of the accused uh, or the accused friends about alcohol consumption, uh, and yet accept the readings of, of the breathalyzer. So that, that may be one thing to look out for when, when this type of expert evidence is called, how does the uh, trial judge resolve the issue of evidence to the contrary. It, it doesn't have to be believed. It's sufficient if it, if it raises a reasonable doubt. But uh, clearly in where some of the judgments fall into error, the trial judge has to do one of the two. Uh, he or she can't, uh, can't do both. Interestingly uh, enough, though, having said that, there's uh, a fairly recent judgment of uh, Justice Zuber in Windsor reported in uh, volume 41, Motor Vehicle Reports, page 81, uh, where he made the following comment uh, after referring to the fact that Carter uh, governs evidence to the contrary cases in Ontario, and I'll return to that in a moment, uh, after acknowledging that an accused is not at the mercy of a machine, he makes the, the following interesting comment. However, uh, nothing in either judgment referring to Carter stands for the conclusion that a trial judge may not weigh the evidence of the breathalyzer test absent the statutory presumption against the defense evidence. So it, it still seems open uh, to uh, have the trial judge view on one hand the readings of the breathalyzer and uh, take it into account in, in evaluating the evidence of, of the accused. Perhaps so on, on uh, what to me is really the the higher threshold and, and the battlefield of the future is really the continued um, application of Carter. Carter was a, a 1985 decision of the Ontario Court of Appeal that, interestingly enough, didn't involve breathalyzer samples but blood samples. Uh, Justice Finlayson, in rendering that judgment, indicated that the accused ought not to be at the mercy of the machine. He or she ought not to have to point out uh, where the readings may uh, may have gone wrong, and he gives the example of one of the blood vials being mixed up, and maybe that's how you got a wrong reading uh, of the accused blood alcohol limit. Uh, that has been consistently applied to breathalyzer samples, and in, in my opinion, uh, you, you have the following so, sort of unique situation arise. If you call expert evidence and it uh, is just to the effect of the room temperature wasn't right or some other type of general challenge and, and you find these cases in the Supreme Court of Canada in Moreau and Crossweight, uh, the courts consistently say that is not evidence to the contrary. You can't just challenge generally the, the working of the breathalyzer. So you have that on the one hand and then you have the accused on the other hand just getting into the um, uh, stand in court saying I have no explanation what happened to the machine, why I have this high reading, but I only had two drinks of alcohol and I have no idea why the machine comes out with a reading of 190. Per Carter, that seems to, uh, if believed or at least to have raised a reasonable doubt, qualify as evidence to the contrary where, in my opinion, leading that similar type of evidence through an expert would, would be dismissed. Some of the um, trial courts, I think, more recently have grappled with whether those two propositions are consistent. There was a judgment given by Judge Nosenchuk in Windsor called Gilbert, G-I-L-B-E-R-T, uh, about a 30-page uh, judgment in March of 1993 where he, he dealt with this issue and concluded there's been no uh, scientific challenge to the breathalyzer. This cannot be what they meant in Carter. 
Uh, Gilbert was appealed to the Summary Conviction Appeal uh, in the Windsor area, and the Summary Conviction Appeal Court said yes, they did mean that in Carter, and unless they uh, tell us differently, it, it does amount to evidence to the contrary. Gilbert is being appealed uh, by the Crown, and um, we may find out in uh, the early New Year whether the uh, Court of Appeal thinks that uh, Carter should continue to be uh, construed in that manner. So you may want to, to watch out for that case. It's called Thomas Gilbert. Okay, thanks, Rick. The topic Guy was asked to, to discuss is uh, the question, quote, how long is too long to be forthwith? which on the surface sounds like the sort of question that would only be asked by Rick Libman and would only interest Rick Libman. But I can tell you that it's dominated conversations in the judge's common room at the old city hall for many months now. In fact, we talk about little else. And, I've prepared a very brief summary of, of the cases that bear on the issue in a little paper that's at pages B1 to B6 um, in the materials. The issue arises because um, Section 254 sub 2, the provision authorizing demands for approved screening device breath samples, makes reference to a demand to require the person to provide forthwith such a sample of breath, et cetera. In Regina and Grant, which um, was a judgment that was released by the Supreme Court of Canada shortly before the, the last session a couple of years ago, um, the Chief Justice stated on behalf of the unanimous court that he could find no reason for departing from the ordinary dictionary definition of the word forthwith suggesting that the breath sample must be taken immediately. And he went on to find that in the circumstances of that case where 30 minutes had elapsed between the demand for the breath sample and the arrival of the alert device at the roadside and the provision of the breath sample, um, that it wasn't a demand authorized by 254 sub 2 and that Mr. Grant was therefore justified in, in refusing to comply with the demand. The problem that arose was that the interpretation by the Supreme Court of Canada and Grant seemed to be at variance with what they had suggested in Thompson three years earlier. Thompson didn't deal specifically with that issue. The, the point there was whether or not the um, roadside screening provisions um, provided a reasonable limit to the right to counsel, and that was the focus of, of the, the judgment. But in the course of deciding that issue, Mr. Justice Ledane, again for unanimous court, um, made reference to the circumstances in which these roadside breath samples would be provided. And he equated forthwith with, quote, as quickly as possible, having regard to the outside operating limit of two hours for the breathalyzer test. And his lordship actually went on to quote from the judgment of Mr. Justice Finlayson in CO, referred to at page three, which had found that there was no difference in meaning between forthwith and forthwith or as soon as practicable. And Mr. Justice Finlayson had stated expressly that that forthwith does not mean immediately. So without Mr. Justice Lemaire recognizing any significant departure, um, they in essence moved from a statement that forthwith does not mean imme immediately to a statement that in fact it does. The other thing that Chief Justice Lemaire said in Grant was that he wasn't going to delve into the question of how many minutes might pass before exceeding the scope of forthwith. And that naturally left it open for other courts to delve into that question um, that would inevitably be raised by counsel in subsequent cases. There was, there was a lot of speculation at the time of Grant, and there was reference to this the last time they had this drinking and driving panel to the Supreme Court imposing the requirement that roadside screening devices would only be used when the officer who stopped the driver actually had it in 
his or her possession at that time and was able to conduct an immediate test. Well, that narrow interpretation of Grant, um, it turns out, hasn't been adopted by the Court of Appeal. There are several Court of Appeal cases that have dealt with this issue since Grant, and I just make um, passing reference to them in the material. Um, the first was Wanakut, which was a judgment um, only about a month after Grant was released. And it was a very brief endorsement, but in the course of it, Madam Justice McKinley stated simply, quote, in our view, the roadside sample was taken forthwith after demand within the meaning of section 254 sub 2, referring to um, a delay in that case of nine minutes between the demand and, and the taking of the breath sample. I think one can safely say, simply based on Wanaket, that if the delay is, is less than nine minutes, um, it's not likely to be found by a trial court to, to exceed the scope of forthwith. The situation got a little bit more complicated with Madam Justice Arbour's judgment in Cote. She held that a 14-minute delay in the circumstances of that case, in fact, fell outside the scope of, of forthwith in 254 sub 2. But the circumstances of that case included a nine-minute drive from the roadside to, to the police station where the alert device was available, and then a further delay of another few minutes at the, at the station before the sample was actually provided. In concluding that the 14 minutes was, was too long to be forthwith, her ladyship stated that it wasn't simply a matter of computing the number of minutes that fall within or without the scope of the word forthwith, and she observed that the number of minutes was in fact less than half of the, the time that had passed in Grant. But she made reference as well to the fact that with the wait at the police station, there had been an opportunity to consult counsel. Um, my view is that she perhaps unnecessarily injected this charter issue into what should, strictly speaking, simply be a matter of statutory interpretation. I, I don't understand personally um, how the meaning of forthwith can vary depending on whether or not there's been an opportunity to consult counsel. But in any event, in Cote, the court certainly did decide that 14 minutes is too long, at least if it involved a trip to the police station. The next appeal that raised the issue was COSA, K-O-S-A, where the Court of Appeal found that seven minutes between the making of the demand and the production of the alert device didn't offend the provisions of 254 sub 2. And most recently in Massassi, Mr. Justice Finlayson, who seems to be the author of so many of these drinking and driving judgments in the Court of Appeal, made it clear that it was acceptable to delay a motorist at the roadside for a couple of minutes to two minutes in that case, in fact, to await the arrival of the alert device and then to make the demand at that point. Um, the total delay in that case from the time the, the motorist, motorist was observed driving until the actual provision of the blood of the breath sample was only four minutes, so the delay wasn't significant. But I think the case is important because it seems to suggest Court of Appeal approval for delaying the demand itself, at least for, for some period of time, although obviously one can't avoid the forthwith requirement by delaying the demand indefinitely and subjecting the motorist to prolonged attention and then, make a, and then making a demand for an immediate breath sample. So the Court of Appeal cases that have delved into this question that was avoided by Mr. Justice Lemaire, I don't think have provided a complete answer um, and I think the reason for that is that they've dealt with each case simply on the basis of, of its own facts. And in my view, they haven't really enunciated the principle that trial judges are supposed to be applying in determining whether any particular delay was um, within or without the forthwith requirement. So it seems to me that, that there's still ample scope for defense counsel to, to raise this issue when there has been um, more than a few minutes that have passed 
um, between the stopping of the of uh, the driver and the making of the demand. I should point out, though, that that this issue really is only relevant, in my view, um, when the chart is one of refusal or failing to comply. Um, the Supreme Court of Canada in Grant and the Court of Appeal cases since um, have recognized that um, it's a valid defense to a charge of failure or refusal um, that the demand itself wasn't, wasn't valid. And that requires focusing on, on the fourth with issue directly. A different set of uh, concerns arise when there's in fact compliance with what may have been a demand for a sample that uh, wasn't forthwith. And that raises the issue of what the significance of a, of a failure after an invalid demand might be. I'm going to ask Janet um, to comment on what she sees as the potential significance. Uh, just in relation to the aspects of the code dealing with roadside screening and the presence or absence of the officer's reasonable and probable grounds to make the demand, it's worth noting that reeling is still good law in the non-charter non -charter sense of making these arguments and whether or not the certificate will be admissible or not. Uh, you'll see in the material there's reference to uh, just a few of the cases in Ontario that have continued to uphold Rilling, including decisions out of the Ontario Court of Appeal. Uh, so just being aware of the distinction between making a charter argument and moving for relief in that sense, or trying to make an argument based on the lack of reasonable probable grounds or a problem with the roadside screening device, you're going to run up against Rilling until the Supreme Court of Canada decides otherwise. Rick, do you see any other issues arising in, in this context? The, um, <clears throat> the charter issues have, uh, have been discussed earlier, and uh, leaving Rilling aside, uh, there's also obviously the 24-2 the uh, discussion, and uh, I'm sure reference is being made very often to Wills, the uh, judgment of Justice Doherty in the Court of Appeal, uh, where there was um, a defective alert machine that produced uh, a wrong result due to the uh, error in calibrating it, and lo and behold, the breathalyzer readings were, were over the legal uh, limit. But leaving that aside, I, I agree with David that the courts on uh, one hand have indicated that forthwith ought not to be resolved by this minute-by-minute -minute computation. So you wind up with uh, a case like Wanakut where the officer intended to wait 15 minutes but for some reason stopped at 9. Um, I, I'm not entirely clear if that, if that does mean that 15 minutes would have been all right or if nine was all right or, or whatever. In uh, Cote, where there was a 14-minute delay, the uh, Court of Appeal seems to, to feel that more of that turned on the fact that nine minutes of the delay occurred at the police station where uh, the accused had access to telephone and, and really the case fell outside of what the Supreme Court had said in Thompson. So I, I, I certainly agree that it's not so much a, a minute by minute computation and uh, you have to have regard to, to all the facts. There are, however, I, I think a, a couple of interesting things you can uh, look for, uh, interesting to perhaps other, other people too, uh, David. Uh, what about this uh, 15 minute period that Doug Lucas pretends not to be responsible for? He, uh, he came to hear our remarks today and uh, we'll be talking about this uh, a little bit later in the afternoon. The Alcohol Test Committee and most uh, police forces will take into account when an accused is stopped whether he or she has recently been smoking a cigarette or, or recently consumed alcohol. There was a line of cases that tried to argue that what if the officer uh, conducted the alert test without inquiring whether there had been recent alcohol consumption. That was the uh, issue in Beach 44 MVR 2nd, page 273, uh, a very brief judgment of the Court of Appeal. Uh, the Court of Appeal in Beach has held that if there's no indication of recent alcohol consumption, the officer is not obliged to wait 15 minutes. Uh, what about the other side of Beach, where the officer does wait 15 minutes? By waiting that period, does that therefore come outside of the forthwith uh, requirement? Uh, His Honor Judge Fairgrieve, in a case called Richard, thought that was merely uh, an administrative type of 
uh, procedure that does fall outside of the forthwith requirement. There's uh, uh, perhaps some more enlightened interpretation by His Honor Judge McDonnell and Plotus, which is at 38 MVR 2nd, page 298. Richard is actually a, a very well-reasoned uh, judgment and deals at length with the uh, Rilling issue as well, and you can find that at 43 MVR 2nd at page 144. So the, the issue, although the, the Court of Appeal had it before them in Wanakut, but you, you really have to read the summary conviction appeal to uh, get all the facts, is whether the officer, by waiting 15 minutes, has therefore uh, taken himself or herself out of the forthwith requirement. The reason for waiting, however, is to ensure an accurate test so that the, the test result on the alert machine will not be falsely high. There's a, a very recent judgment of the British Columbia Court of Appeal called Burnshaw, reported at uh, 28 British Columbia Appeal Cases, page 248. Uh, they have a, an interesting in interpretation of this argument. British Columbia is the jurisdiction that uh, gave us Gartrell, which is the, the case that um, is most often cited for the 15-minute uh, challenge. In Gartrell, the officer waited 15 minutes and uh, Justice Callahan, I believe, of the British Columbia Supreme Court held that that fell outside of the forthwith requirement. In Burnshaw, Gartrell is put before the British Columbia Court of Appeal. They don't resolve the issue. There's actually a 20-minute uh, interval there. But they do make the comment that had the officer not uh, waited the, the requisite 15-minute period, or to put it another way, had the officer not taken steps to ensure that there would have been an accurate and reliable alert test result, that would have deprived the officer of reasonable and probable grounds to make the breathalyzer demand thereafter. So uh, that, that may be something that, that can be argued as well. The 15-minute uh, uh, interval waiting for the police uh, procedure, the alcohol test procedure, is going to go to the Court of Appeal uh, in a case called Pierman, P-I-E-R-M-A-N, uh, and that should get there early in the new year. The other thing I'll, I'll mention very briefly that uh, you may want to watch out for, although it's a, a fairly odd fact occurrence, reference was made earlier uh, this morning by Kathy Cooper to Hishon. Hishon was the case where the Court of Appeals said it was all right for the officer to ask about recent uh, alcohol consumption without giving a 10B warning, and, and thereafter he made a breathalyzer demand. So the law in Ontario uh, taking into account Hishon and Saunders is that the police are entitled to either conduct a sobriety test at roadside, administer an alert test, or now thirdly, simply ask whether the, the accused has been drinking. In a recent judgment called uh, Coburn, C-O-C-K-B-U-R-N, uh, reported at 45 MVR 2nd at page 143, uh, Justice Brockenshire of the General Division held that that was all well and good, but they can only do one and not a combination of two. Uh, there didn't seem to be a particular concern about which two were done, but that if you did two of them, uh, that seemed to fall outside of the forthwith uh, requirement um, stated in Section 254.2. So that, that seems to be a, another issue. There are, there are a few other cases in Ontario that have accepted that rationale that Whatever forthwith means, you're entitled to uh, perform one of these three tests, but not a combination. Coburn is going to the Court of Appeal in the new year as well. I think you're probably getting a sense of why nobody felt too guilty about asking Rick Libman to step in at the last moment to participate in this panel. He talks like this all the time. <laughs> he's, he's referred to a lot of cases that aren't referred to it in the material, and while well, we're not here to sell Rick Libman's books, I. I, I would suggest that um, reading his Breathalyzer Lane articles in, the, in his journal and keeping up with his articles and current developments is, a, is an easy way to get an encapsulated version of a lot of these issues with um, the appropriate case references. All right, um, I'm going to ask Gail to assume this fascinating fact situation. The accused refuses to supply a, a breath sample, either at the roadside or a breathalyzer breath sample. 
saying that he's read something about how both machines are, are fairly unreliable and that he's much more interested in providing uh, blood samples so there won't be any, any dispute about what his blood alcohol level actually is. Is that going to provide him with a defense to a charge of failing or refusing to comply with a, with a demand? Well, for those people who generally start their research by turning to uh, Martin's criminal code, up until 1994 edition, the leading case was Regina and Wall. It was the one cited in the code that basically said no. Um, if you offer to supply your blood instead of the breath, that's just too bad. That isn't a lawful excuse. However, back in 1990, or recently in 1990, the British Columbia Supreme Court, in a case, and, and this is all in a, in a paper that's in, um, in the materials, the sites, in a case called Regina and Lewis, the court held that, yes, in certain circumstances, if there is a bona fide offer of blood as opposed to breath, that you could find that to be a reasonable excuse to refuse to give a, blood, to give a breath sample. Um, in the interim intervening event that had been between Wall and this case of Lewis was obviously a, um, an amendment to the criminal code that exists now, allowing officers in certain circumstances to make a demand for a blood sample. The court has apparently they seemed to take that into account as well in determining that it, it did seem appropriate that if, if the accused had a real concern, and that was the problem, the reliability of the machine, the breathalyzer machine, to be accurate, that it would also interfere with his right to possibly make full answer in defense because um, if, if the machine wasn't reliable and he had some real concerns about it, then the offer to, to take blood was a real alternative. And, and since, obviously, a lot of these cases deal with the dangers of drinking and driving and the necessity to find and stop people from, the, as the courts often talk about, prevent the carnage on the highways, that that result would still basically be met by blood being taken because you could find out whether the person was over 80 or not and any possible defense obviously may be eliminated if the accused was clearly over 80. I mean, you really have them then because you've got the blood that's been analyzed. That is your basic research when you turn to Martin's in 1994 because it just says contra Regina and Lewis with the site. Well, unfortunately, that is not the end of the news at this point because after this matter was reopened, the British Columbia Court of Appeal, the Ontario Court of Appeal, and the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal all got involved as well. And in each one of those cases has pretty soundly said that Lewis is not good law. Um, dealing first with the British Columbia Court of Appeal, it was a very br brief oral judgment, and they overruled the Supreme Court of BC. And they, just, they just said, that although the accused had honestly believed that the blood samples would be more accurate, that this alternative offer did not in law give a lawful excuse for refusing to provide breath samples, that the criminal code did not provide for this as an alternative offer. The only question that the court had to deal with was, was a breath demand properly made by the officer? Did the accused comply with that breath demand? And, and they held that this say, you know, go ahead, take my blood, was not itself a lawful excuse. So they said, no, that was it. Uh, the very next day, the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal, and the, these are all in 1993 cases, came to exactly the same conclusion in a case called Regina and Weir. Um, the court talked about lawful excuse being objectively reasonable, and the, the accused having to prove this on the balance of probabilities. So uh, they go back into the, this reasoning of the belief that, that, that David talked about of, um, I've read something in the newspaper that maybe these alert machines aren't great or maybe the breathalyzer machines may have the same sort of problem. The accused cannot just turn around and say, okay, I'll take my blood because I don't think I trust these machines because there's obviously some problems with them. There has to be a rational belief to that. Now, obviously, the, the Weir case may very well have come up before the J3A alert, uh, J3A tests. And if you have a J3A, one in which the demand was made, and then the person refuses the breathalyzer machine, you may be able to have a bit of a distinguishing aspect between those. But again, the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal was pretty clear that um, the legislative intent 
to stop drinking and driving was an over overwhelming concern in these cases. And if the officers weren't prepared to take the blood, which in most of these cases they're just not, um, you're, you're, just not uh, you're just out of luck in offering a blood sample instead of a breast sample. One week later, our Ontario Court of Appeal came out with their decision on this issue. And in the case of Richardson, and they specifically held that Lewis in the, in the BC Supreme Court was wrongly decided. So you're going to have to overcome that case, clearly, if you're going to try and argue this defense in Ontario. Um, they just held that the rationale and reasoning in that old case of Regina and Wall was proper, that an alternative offer of a blood sample could not constitute a lawful excuse for refusing to supply your breath. And that was pretty much the end of it, and the accused was convicted. So as much as, as you may have had some brief hopes looking in the 1994 Martin's, Court of, Martin's uh, Criminal Code, I'd say that those three other cases have pretty much dashed the possibility. So you'd best be careful in uh, what advice you give a person who phones you at 3 o'clock in the morning saying, can I offer my blood? That, uh, you better have some fairly firm ground before you tell them to go ahead and refuse giving a breast sample. All right, recognizing that these blood sample cases are fairly rare, at least in my experience, do you have any comments, Rick, about the other issues that arise in relation to, to blood samples, particularly when they have been taken? Yeah, from the, from the non-charter point of view, uh, Phil uh, Perlmutter earlier talked about Dersh and, and the, um, the recent uh, privacy component to obtaining a, a blood sample. On the non-charter front, there are two things that uh, come to mind that you may want to look for. The uh, Authority for making a blood demand uh, is contained in 254.3b, but the section that follows, 254 sub 4, contains a health and uh, safety assurance to assure the accused that the blood will be taken by a qualified medical practitioner and that uh, it will be taken in circumstances that will not endanger his or her life or safety. It has been held by the Supreme Court of Canada recently in green that a blood demand that does not contain that health and safety assurance is not a valid blood demand. Green uh, is reported at 70 CCC 3rd at page 285. And in green, which was uh, a refusal case, very much like uh, Grant and Cote, the uh, Supreme Court of Canada went on to hold that the failure to uh, incorporate that health and safety assurance in the, in the blood demand was therefore a reasonable excuse not to uh, provide the, the uh, blood sample. So I guess uh, one could add to the comment Gail made when you get the phone call, um, you might want to try to determine whether the accused has been given the uh, blood and safety assurance. I think you will find, however, that they have because the uh, police have been notified of the uh, green decision and, and the blood demand cards have been modified to reflect that. There's also uh, an issue that Unlike Green, what if the accused, however, did comply with the blood demand? The uh, Nova Scotia Court of Appeal in Langdon, the, I'm sorry, that's the Newfoundland Court of Appeal in Langdon, the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal in Brown, held that in the case where an accused does provide a sample of blood to a deficient blood demand not containing the health and, and safety assurance that uh, the factor of the omission to that health and safety assurance is irrelevant. So you, you may find that there is a difference to be made whether you're dealing with a, a refusal case, which is green, or a compliance case, Langdon and Brown. The other issue I'll, I'll mention very briefly, uh, also that may arise from time to time, you'll notice that in the code there's a, a, an odd type of mandatory disclosure mechanism contained in 258.1d and 258 sub 4, and accused must be given notice of the existence of an additional or second sample of blood within a three-month period. Our Court of Appeal in Montgomery, uh, 70 Canadian Criminal Cases, 3rd, page 229, and the Supreme Court of Canada in Edgar, E-G-G-E-R, in June of 1993, have held that where the Crown uh, is not able to prove that the accused has been given notice of the three-month uh, limitation period for demanding the additional blood sample that the Crown is deprived of being able to rely upon the certificate or the presumption that would be set out in the certificate. So the, the other thing that I can suggest you therefore look out for, if you have a client who has been 
uh, arrested for a, a drinking and driving offense where a blood sample has been taken, uh, you may want to look at the clock and see whether there has been a certificate uh, or a charge laid for that matter uh, within the three-month period. The Supreme Court of Canada and our Court of Appeal have held that an accused is not under an obligation to demand a, a, the additional sample of his or her blood where they're not informed uh, prior to whether they're going to be charged or, or what the result of the certificate reading uh, turned out to be. Thanks, Rick. I want to give Dave Humphrey a, a back situation now. Um, assuming a police officer wants to avoid a lot of these technical problems that arise in the context of impaired driving charges and instead choose to lay a charge of dangerous driving. And I'm going to give you these facts, that the accused was, was speeding into an intersection doing about 70 kilometers per hour in a 40 kilometer per hour school zone. There was evidence of some drinking, um, although the blood alcohol level was less than, than 80 and the effects of alcohol were described as being slight. And there was also conflicting evidence, but still some evidence that the accused had gone through the intersection as the light was turning from yellow to red and that the accused struck a passenger who just got off a bus walked in front of the bus and into the path of, of the accused car. He's charged with dangerous driving. Are you going to plead him guilty to that charge? Is this a private client or a legal aid client? <laughs> <laughs> Either way, I'm pleading him not guilty. <laughs> um, that's a, a fairly common situation where you have this uh, mixture of both uh, an element of drinking and driving and elements of bad driving, and uh, on the facts given to me, I'm, I'm to assume that the charge was uh, one of dangerous driving. Um, I do plead uh, my client not guilty, given those facts, and uh, in approaching the situation, I want to first identify and define both the actus reus and the mens rea uh, for dangerous driving, because there have been uh, recent developments in that area, and that's what my uh, brief paper deals with. Um, the actus reus is, uh, is easily ascertained by simply reading the offense creating provision in section 249 of the code and paraphrasing that, it is driving in a manner which is dangerous to the public having regard to all the circumstances and those of course include the nature of the place, uh, the condition of the place uh, and the amount of traffic uh, that is or might be expected in that place and all other relevant uh, circumstances. Until recently, it was not so easy to ascertain what the mens rea for the offense was or what the fault element uh, was for the offense of dangerous driving. And that's what I tried to deal with uh, in uh, my paper at page uh, B21. Uh, the issue of mens rea or the fault element for dangerous driving uh, was addressed and substantially answered uh, by the Supreme Court of Canada in its uh, decision in Regina versus Hundle. And the issue there raised by uh, the appellant Hundle was whether there was a subjective element uh, of fault in the uh, offense of dangerous driving, whether the Crown had to prove that the accused actually knew that he was driving in a dangerous manner. And there was some pre-charter authority for that proposition in the Supreme Court decisions in uh, Mann, Binus, and Peta, because those decisions spoke of a distinction between inadvertent negligence, which would support a charge of careless driving, and advertent negligence, which was necessary to prove a charge of dangerous driving. So advertent negligence clearly connoted some subjective element, some appreciation on the part of the accused that he was driving in a dangerous manner. Notwithstanding those uh, decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada, in Ontario, our Court of Appeal uh, adopted an objective uh, standard. And I've indicated that uh, in the case of uh, Regina and Baudouin, uh, a decision of the Ontario Court of Appeal that as early as uh, 1973, the objective approach was adopted in Ontario. And our court held that a conviction uh, could be obtained for dangerous driving on proof by the Crown that the accused's driving constituted a danger to the lives or safety of others 
and that the danger resulted from the accused's departure from the standard of care that a prudent driver would have exercised. Once those elements have been established, the accused would be convicted unless there was some innocent explanation. Uh, in Hundle, uh, the appellant had uh, invoked not only the pre-charter cases, but had also attempted to argue that uh, as a principle of fundamental justice guaranteed by Section 7 of the Charter, uh, every crime has a component uh, of fault. And it was argued on behalf of Hundle that for dangerous driving, uh, the fault element should be an element of subjective appreciation by the driver that his driving was, uh, was dangerous. And of course, uh, Hundle relied on uh, previous decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada in cases like the BC Motor Vehicle Reference case, um, Viancourt, and that line of cases. Uh, ultimately, the uh, court rejected the argument for a subjective mens rea component in dangerous driving and adopted uh, an objective standard and held that negligence is an acceptable uh, basis for criminal liability. Uh, and the reasons for doing that uh, were manifold, but, uh, and I've summarized them at page two uh, of my paper, but uh, pithily summarized, uh, Justice Corey noted that it would be a denial of common sense for a driver <coughs> whose conduct was objectively dangerous to be acquitted on a ground that he was not thinking of his manner of driving at the time of the accident. And uh, in Hundle, uh, Justice Corey sets out the test for dangerous driving, which I've set out at page three uh, of the article. And the test is that uh, the jury may convict if satisfied that viewed objectively uh, the driving was in a manner that was dangerous to the public, having regard to all the circumstances. And in making that assessment, the trier of fact should be satisfied that the conduct amounted to a marked departure, emphasis on the marked departure, uh, from the standard of care that a reasonable person would observe in the accused's situation. And if that is shown, there will be a conviction for dangerous driving, unless some explanation uh, for the driving is offered, such as the sudden and uh, unexpected onset uh, of an illness. Now, prior to uh, Hundle, uh, the law in Ontario was as stated uh, in the decision of the Court of Appeal in Lowe, and that was that uh, the jury would be instructed that the necessary element of fault for dangerous driving uh, could be found in the accused's departure from the standard of care uh, that a prudent driver would have exercised having regard to all the circumstances. So it was just a departure from the standard of a prudent driver, not a marked departure. Um, subsequent to Hundle, our uh, Court of Appeal uh, considered the uh, fault element in dangerous driving in a case, uh, Regina versus Rajic, which uh, is cited at the top of page four. Uh, and uh, based on uh, Hundle, uh, our court uh, held that the level of negligence required for dangerous driving is a marked departure from the standard of a prudent driver, which is uh, uh, clearly higher than uh, the law as it was previously uh, under the decision of our Court of Appeal in low. Uh, and in Rajic, the jury had been instructed uh, in accordance with the law uh, as it uh, was under Lowe, uh, and the Court of Appeal uh, uh, held that that was an error, that the jury should have been instructed uh, that they should uh, look for a marked departure from the uh, conduct of, uh, or the standard of a prudent driver. So uh, uh, Rajic is uh, helpful because it states the, uh, uh, the elevated test. It's also helpful uh, because it shows just how bad the driving has to be to satisfy that standard. The, the facts that uh, Judge Fairgrave gave to me are the facts in uh, Rajic. And what we had there was a, a driver driving northbound, approaching an intersection. The light may have been uh, uh, red. Uh, a bus stopped. The driver deciding to make a maneuver where he passed around the bus uh, and uh, entered the intersection not in the northbound lane, but in the southbound lane of traffic 
and it was uh, uncontested that he was in the southbound lane of traffic as he was traveling northbound, going through this intersection, passing a bus uh, where passengers were exiting the bus, and it was not disputed that he was speeding at the time he attempted that maneuver, and it was not disputed that he had been drinking, and the evidence of the officer was that there was at least some uh, indication of impairment. On all those facts, the court said, we are still sending this matter back. We are not satisfied that a jury would necessarily find a marked departure from the standard of a prudent driver in the circumstances. So to me, Rajik is very helpful. Not only states the higher test, but it gives us some uh, assistance in uh, arguing that there really is required some seriously bad driving before one can find a marked departure and therefore dangerous driving. Uh, Rick, I don't know whether you agree with that last comment or uh, whether you have any views on where you draw the line now between dangerous driving and, and criminal negligence. Uh, we're short of time, so uh, let me make a, a brief comment. Uh, I had thought we had one stilato where we got rid of marked departure uh, and those words from impaired driving, and I, I guess what was happening was they were re-emerging in the, in the test for uh, dangerous driving. I wonder about the, the trier of fact, particularly a jury. Uh, the appellate courts seem to think it's not very complicated in the case of dangerous driving. You read them the definition, tell them that it's a marked departure from the standard of a reasonable person in all the circumstances. For criminal negligence, you read them the definition of criminal negligence and tell them look for a marked and substantial departure from the standard of a reasonable person make a general allowance uh, for other factors that perhaps are more subjective or a generous subjective uh, test and then send them away and let them figure it out. And I, I sort of wonder if anyone's going to be convicted very often of criminal negligence after that. Uh, the Supreme Court of Canada denied leave to appeal on RAGIC. Uh, so that's now the test for dangerous driving in Ontario. And I think David uh, makes a, a, a very important point at the end. Even taking into account the, the more onerous test on the Crown in Rajik, uh, there were quite a few indicia of what perhaps I would have thought and other people would have thought were dangerous driving, and the Court of Appeal wasn't prepared to say that. Thanks. We just have a few minutes left, but I want to ask Gail. Uh, assuming Defence Counsel has done his or her job properly and presented careful evidence from the accused about his or her alcoholic consumption and toxicologist evidence about the consequences for the person's blood alcohol level. And after careful argument by defense counsel, the trial judge says simply, quote, having heard the evidence, I'm satisfied that the accused should be found guilty, unquote. Does defense counsel have any recourse after, uh, in quotation marks, judgment like that? <laughs> okay, well, after the, the information I told you about the blood. Um, this is a little bit more positive as far as defense is concerned. Yes, uh, the answer sort of is it depends. Um, if you file an appeal, in the Summary Conviction Appeals of Toronto, on a judgment like that, you're going to run into a standard factum that we file in response. And it's going to include cases called McDonald and um, in the Supreme Court of Canada and McCullough and um, Smith from the Alberta Court of Appeal in the Supreme Court of Canada and Harper. A number of cases which have consistently said that it is not necessary for a judge to give any reasons for judgment. It is not an error of law for a trial judge to say, I find that the offense is proved and the accused is guilty. So it, it sounds, on the face of it, that, that also sounds like a pretty depressing answer as far as you're concerned. However, the courts of appeal have started to look at this issue and have said, no, we don't really like that strict no reasons doesn't equal any hope at all on an appeal. And they've, they've tended to look at it in terms of is there, can we be assured as an appellate court that there hasn't been some sort of miscarriage of justice done here? So in the case, as, as it's been postulated, the question of there's been all this wonderful evidence to the contrary, which should, on a rational conclusion, have given the trial judge some concern of whether the Crown had proved the case beyond a reasonable doubt or whether a doubt 
should have been raised in the trial judge's mind. The Ontario Court of Appeal in cases like Barrett and a couple of others have said, wait a second, let's take a look at this and is there some rationale or some reason where we should be concerned as an appellate court that the judge may not have grasped the argument, properly adverted his or her mind to the arguments being made, just misunderstood it or not applied the law correctly. So you have a, an argument that can be made on the basis of some of these tests, and there it was a very specific one. This was a case in which there was a voir dire issue that was over four weeks, and there was a, a fairly distinct conflict between the evidence of the police officers as to how the statement was taken, and the accused saying, hey, wait a second, there's, there's good reason it shouldn't go in because of the, the, you know, the basic tests on a voir dire, either it was beaten out of me or there was in, um, inducements. At the end of this, the trial judge adjourned at six weeks to consider the matter, came back and said that uh, basically I have made findings of credibility on conflicting evidence and the statement is going in, period. I had no reasons other than that. Now, the Court of Appeal in that case, this is the Ontario Court of Appeal, s did not disagree in principle with the Supreme Court of Canada's rulings in McDonald and Smith and Harper and things of that nature, saying that the mere absence of reasons does not give rise to an error. But they went in terms of framing their decision, and I think this is going to have to be, if you, if you want to win on appeal, you're going to have to be able to raise these arguments, that they could not determine whether a miscarriage of justice had occurred. So the question really becomes, what are your facts in the trial that, wants, that you want to give rise to an appeal issue? on this evidence to the contrary or, or any other thing for that nature in which you have a direct conflict in the evidence. Um, in this case, because there had been a real conflict of credibility between the police officers and the accused, and there was some sort of external supporting evidence which the court said might have corroborated what the accused said. Um, this had left open the possibility that a miscarriage of justice may have occurred and therefore they were prepared to send this matter back for a new trial. Um, so the fairness issue really is the one when you're dealing with appeals that you're going to have to address. So not as, not as pessimistic as you might think, Supreme Court of Canada cases. All right, Rick just passed me a copy of Mr. Justice Subu's judgment in Lefebvre and there's a, a helpful sentence here at the, in the last paragraph of the judgment, quote, oral reasons for judgment given by trial judges subject to the pressure of heavy dockets should not be examined as if they were law review essays, unquote. Um, and I, I think it's only fair to recognize that provincial judges in particular are subject to a lot of pressures in, in the courtroom. We see the eyeballs rolling and, and we know that the accused at least are more interested in the bottom line than, than the reasons. Um, but I think most of us feel obliged to respond to the to the issues that have been raised by counsel, and I think most of us feel obliged to give considered reasons for judgment, notwithstanding the, the boredom that might be induced by that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I think our time is up now. Okay, if we can uh, get going with our final panel prior to the uh, lunch break, I, I know that uh, the three panelists who are here are very familiar to uh, all of you, Michelle First, Hugh Campbell, and Larry Feldman. Michelle? Thanks, Rick. Hugh Campbell has uh, provided in your materials a very helpful sentencing survey. So, Hugh, my first question is directed to you about that survey. Do you see any trend there uh, in sentencing for drinking and driving cases? Thank you, Michelle, and uh, also thank you, Larry. Every year I get to be the uh, bearer of bad news. I want you to notice this year, though, that I'm sitting on the left of the moderator. <laughs> I'd like to thank Ava Arbuck, my associate, who put together this survey. I think that you will find it helpful. She's done quite a job on it. Each year uh, in the past, since 1981, I have warned you that, uh, in my view, that the trend of sentencing was towards higher sentences. If only because I am getting too old to bear the scornful looks and raucous hissing that I get, this year I'm very pleased to be able to tell you that, uh, in my view, the pendulum has swung out 
as far as, far as it's going to go towards the high end. It appears to me that at least for the next year or two, the range of sentences for drinking and driving offenses will be much wider. Now, you'll note that I didn't say that uh, the high end of the range will be coming down. It, indeed, it, it may be that we will see the high end go higher. But what I mean to say is that in my view, we are about to see a period of time when sentences for drinking and driving offenses will not disclose a trend either upwards or downwards. In the next year or two, I expect that the courts will find more and more cases of exceptional circumstances, which will mean a much wider range of sentences than we have seen since uh, the Queen and McVeigh in 1985. I make that prediction based on a number of factors, not the least of which is the recent concerted efforts of uh, the government and the courts to relieve some of the congestion which is strangling our, our system. And given the enormous number of drinking and driving offenses on the docket on any given day, I can't imagine that, uh, that problem escaping attention. Now, I'd like to emphasize here that I speak uh, only for myself and uh, not as a spokesperson for the Ministry of the Attorney General or certainly for this government. But it occurs to me. <laughs> that uh, when a judge, when the judges and the courts are given more discretion to fashion a sentence which is appropriate to the particular circumstances of the offense and the offender, there's a far, likely, uh, far more likely, greater likelihood that uh, early pleas will be induced. And I think that that's something that the government ought to be looking at and probably is looking at. Um, Another factor which I have considered is the wide range of discretion given the courts by Section 259. And driving pro prohibitions, it would seem, judging by the large number of appeals that we see in my office against the length of such orders, uh, that seems to be as meaningful a deterrent as incarceration. And I think that that is something that the courts are going to be recognizing. That the driving prohibition can protect the public, and it probably is in these rough economic times as meaningful a deterrent as. Uh, as any period of incarceration. And it occurs to me that in the area of driving prohibition, there is a great deal of flexibility and a great deal of room for some legislative initiatives which could afford the courts more discretion. So I see the trend in the next two years, as I say, to, towards giving the trial judges much more discretion in the fashioning of sentences. Well, maybe we'll have a chance to ask you two years from now if you were right or wrong. Um, Larry, Hughes referred to the congestion in the courts and the large number of impaired driving cases on the provincial court dockets. Do you think there's any basis upon um, which we should be trying to uh, support an amendment to the Highway Traffic Act that would give some relief against automatic license suspensions? Um, I, I'm told that the government actually is discussing uh, once again in, in a new generation um, uh, the possibility of of giving judges discretion to, uh, in, in their prohibition order, to allow for what used to be called uh, back in the early 1970s intermittent um, privileges, driving privileges uh, for employment purposes. One of the reasons it uh, fell out of favor in, uh, in the earlier middle 1970s was, was the fact that it was subject to so much abuse. But there are some new factors here. Number one, with uh, modern technology, uh, it, it, it appears that on a practical basis uh, there could be more effective enforcement, but, but there's more reason than that. Um, the, the sentences in impaired drivings, driving cases really can create an enormous hardship, particularly for first-time offenders or otherwise uh, good character uh, uh, accused. Um, People lose their jobs, families uh, suffer. There's still a widely held view that a one-year license suspension is, uh, is excessive. And, and that's what you was referring to when uh, you have a lot of uh, provincial judges wanting to be more creative and have a wider uh, discretion in their uh, sentences uh, in, in a way that brings it more in line with traditional uh, principles of sentencing, including rehabilitation. So there is a basis. There is a basis in the, um, in the legislation for amendment. I hope the government follows through on it positively. 
and it may be that this group here, by, by talking about it more openly, will bring uh, uh, pressure to bear and some, uh, give some intelligent debate to the issue. Uh, Section 259 is, uh, is, is, is the statutory basis for the uh, mandatory uh, uh, license suspension, but it can be done on terms. The, word, the words are, make an order prohibiting the offender, but, but that uh, the simple reading of it uh, isn't limiting so that the judge has some discretion. I want to pause to tell you that um, in a decision uh, from the Northwest Territories in the Supreme Court, uh, uh, quite a prolific uh, judge, uh, Mr. Justice DeWeert, reported in 19 Motor Vehicles, second series at uh, page 73, um, where there was an application to stay the uh, prohibition order. This judge, uh, as one of the terms of his prohibition order, uh, actually um, uh, prohibited prohibited the driver subject to the operation of a motor vehicle solely for the purpose of carrying out his duties required of him by his employer. Now, I, I quickly went through the case to determine if there was reference to the Highway Traffic Act in that jurisdiction. I have to assume that, that it wasn't written the same as ours, which is just an automatic uh, license suspension upon conviction by a trial court. But, but going on with the concept, which, which, which should be talked about, uh, there's no question with modern technology and, and, and the wide enforcement discretion of a police officer under what still may be called Section 30A of the Highway Traffic Act for an officer to stop the vehicle to determine if, uh, or for the purpose of, of enforcing the public safety on, on, on the roads. It may be more workable now. Um, there's, there's enormous social and economic costs uh, to losses of license. Uh, by, by, the, uh, by the member of the family who may be supporting that family. And in addition, I think the government may also be considering this. Uh, when we went from the three-month suspension to the one-year suspension, um, that almost ended the flood of guilty pleas in the courtroom. And it may be the case that um, given what, what Hugh was re referring to was, was the overcrowded uh, courts, and now the possibility that people can still work, uh, still drive while working despite being suspended. You may see uh, more uh, plea resolutions, and that'll be a good thing too because uh, it's not as simple as whether you're going to drive or not drive. There's a lot of complicated case with, cases with aggravating features, and that can get thrown into the, the hopper when you do a lot of uh, plea bargaining. There's no question that trial judges would like that discretion. You can incorporate other, uh, other aspects that are important to rehabilitation, important to society, community service orders, uh, enforcing uh, treatment uh, for alcohol if there's even a whiff of that. So um, uh, there, there is a basis in the legislation. In addition, uh, the, the federal government and the provincial government can work together uh, on, that, uh, on that score and the Highway Traffic Act can be amended accordingly to respond to the direction of the trial judge. Hopefully Larry's comments will reach somebody in a position of authority. Um, Larry, I want to move on to the substance of sentencing in these kinds of cases um, and ask you, uh, given that defense counsel sometimes sees sentencing and impaired in over 80 cases as really a pro forma sort of exercise, is there anything that defense counsel can usefully do in speaking to sentence? Well. Uh, I don't have a lot of confidence in, in, in thinking that uh, sentencing is pro forma, even, on, um, uh, even in situations where you've got a simple impaired driving case and a first offender, because we're still reeling from the McFay decision and from the subsequent amendments, which for a number of years seem to be increasing the sentencing tariff on a, on a weekly basis, uh, so that uh, there always was and has been some risk uh, with some aggravating features, uh, a higher reading, speeding, a small accident, a related record as opposed to a, a second offense, uh, uh, fail to remain, uh, uh, dangerous driving, a bad Highway Traffic Act record, that, 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 a, that a provincial judge still might impose um, a short, sharp term of incarceration, uh, impose a, an excessive fine, 
give a longer license suspension, which didn't fit the offender or the offense. Um, and, and it has to do with a number of reasons. Uh, the amendments in the McFay decision seem to say to, to trial judges, uh, I want you to deal with a, what is at least in part a medical and social uh, problem. Some of the judges in the county towns felt that they could make an, a deterrent impact uh, by offering sentences that, that, that sanctioned the offense. But fortunately, a number of things have brought us, have redressed the balance. Uh, uh, Michelle, Hugh, and I were just talking recently that however we may feel about the civil liberties aspect of the RIDE program or any other programs by government, Ministry of Transport, et cetera, it has served an educational uh, uh, purpose and, and, ha and has given effect to a deterrent function. Um, there's no question that our generation, younger generations, are well aware of the problem, and, and the statistics have gone down in terms of drinking and driving. Uh, along with that, uh, I just want to make quick reference to a decision of a couple of years ago from the British Columbia Court of Appeal, which, on the one hand, has um, continued to impose high sentences, perhaps higher sentences than Ontario. No question higher sentences in Ontario in these kinds of cases. Um, uh, but, but. The decision of Mr. Justice Woods in a case called Sweeney, I'm sorry I don't have the citation, you can find it, I just carry around my copy of the unreported decision, uh, was, a, was a very lucid and important judgment in, in, in saying, let's get back to the traditional principles of sentencing. We can't use retribution in these kinds of cases <coughs> uh, disguised as deterrence because the, uh, to solve social and medical problems because the state is very much involved. Uh, his Lordship pointed out that the government profits from the sale of alcohol, that it really allows uh, drinking and driving to go on because they establish a minimal level. And as in that province and in this province, there were, there were no, the government didn't follow through in implementing the discharge provisions made available by Parliament. So the court was recognizing certain realities uh, and uh, as well as the fact that consequences, which would increase the tariff, were, were uh, more a result of good or bad luck. So the court wanted to put proportionality back into looking at moral culpability uh, and, um, and went back to the basics in saying the principles of sentencing are to preserve the authority of and promote respect for the laws. Uh, accountability was the issue, and which brings us back to uh, your role in discussing and putting your best foot forward both on mitigation and aggravation in your particular case. Uh, His Lordship pointed out that the flaw in emphasizing general deterrence, as had been done after 1985, was that um, the greater the sanction didn't necessarily mean the greater the deterrent effect. So, and it also pointed out that in reality, specific deterrence really didn't have any practical reality for most people. So it emphasized rehabilitation uh, if rehabilitation is reasonably possible, then apply it, even in a serious case. Uh, and that's where your role comes in to, to, to make sure that no judge who is on a, on a campaign to stamp out impaired driving uh, goes beyond the line. Uh, so what I would recommend you do, and, and I'm talking to a lot of experienced people, so I'll be very quick and very general, is deal with the, your aggrav Deal with the driving itself by minimizing or explaining the driving. Um, uh, point out the lack of all the other aggravating features one might expect, uh, no speed, loss of control, et cetera, et cetera. Point out that it's really aberrant conduct standing in sharp contrast to, to otherwise good character. Deal with remorse um, and uh, answer the aggravating features. For example, if there's, you may, uh, if you feel there's a danger of of incarceration or a lengthy license suspension, and depending on the circumstances, meet head on your aggravating features and come to court um, in a way that in which your client is shown, hopefully sincerely, to have dealt with them. If there's bad driving, previous convictions, it may be that your client doesn't want the lengthy suspension, doesn't want to go to jail, it would be just too traumatic. He may voluntarily stop driving. If there's high reading or, or, or a possibility that there's some alcoholism here, um, treatment, uh, alcohol, uh, go to AA. Um, uh, if he was abusive, as some uh, otherwise decent people are when they're 
impaired to be abusive to the police officer. It may take a, a simple thing like an apology. Uh, there's uh, established through other evidence there's been no drinking since the event. So you're seeing with, you're, you're putting someone before the court who's in some danger but has taken some steps. That's what a judge wants in the direction of rehabilitation. List your mitigating features, um, and I'll list some of them. It's a first offense. There's a lack of aggravating features. Um, point out that it's aberrant conduct. He's a working responsible, otherwise, otherwise contributing member of the community. There's a guilty plea or early guilty plea. There's been treatment, no alcohol since, genuine remorse. Uh, there's counseling, there's family support, or there may have been cooperation with the police officer. And some character evidence. Some judges may tell you character evidence doesn't make a, make a difference because of the manner of driving, but uh, I, I think character evidence uh, uh, completes the picture. Hugh, we know that alcohol consumption is often a, a factor in other kinds of driving cases, such as dangerous driving or criminal negligence. What factors are judges considering when they're imposing sentence in those sorts of cases? Well, Michelle, I think it's obvious to everyone here that what I get as I read the case is that uh, if you are convicted of dangerous driving or criminal negligence, you're in trouble. And if there's alcohol involved, you're in a whole lot of trouble. And I think that the reason for that is because uh, there are two things in the wake of McVeigh that the courts are considering. It's not only the marked departure from the uh, careful and safe driving practices, but it also it's the culpability of taking control of a motor vehicle uh, while your faculties are impaired. In my view, what the court is going to be looking for, uh, well, first of all, I should say, if you're convicted of either of those offenses, you're probably looking at, uh, at a substantial period of incarceration. But the other thing is the driving prohibition, which can be very, very lengthy and quite devastating to a person's employment opportunities and so on. So I think that uh, really what you should be addressing or what judges are looking at uh, now is uh, what are the factors giving rise to the impairment? This is an instance where a person has driven 20 miles to a tavern to spend an evening with uh, his or her friends, uh, knowing full well that uh, they intend to stay until closing time. And then they get in the car after being told by people, hey, we'll drive you home or you can take a cab and so on. The court may well say that that is so culpable that it deserves a lengthy period of uh, prohibition and it may even add to the period of incarceration. If, on the other hand, the circumstances are such that uh, it is obvious that this is a sort of a momentary fall from grace, in my view, counsel will be able to marshal the mitigating factors that uh, Larry has spoken of and be able to point out to the court that this person, uh, this, this really was a, uh, a uh, momentary mistake and it wasn't something that the person ought to have known of and, uh, and avoided. And so I think that that is what the courts are looking for now because as I say, the courts are looking to have more discretion and I think that's a good thing that they should have more discretion. One of the things that um, Hugh and, and Larry pointed out in our background discussions for the panel was that the timing of something like treatment for uh, alcohol and alcohol problem can be important and so too can the way in which that problem is described if you're getting a report from the treating individual. Hugh, what are your views about that? Well, um, in, in my view, uh, the the fact that a person has attempted to get treatment is something that should be brought before the court. Many people take the view that a, a chronic abuser who has uh, joined AA in several times and has fallen off the wagon and so on, they ought not to bring that before the court. But in fact, I believe that judges understand today, and even some crowns understand this, that it's, it's a medical problem. And the effort to get treatment is what the courts will be looking at. It's not whether or not it was successful. But people do understand that you can make the effort to get treatment and you can fail and you must keep trying to make it. So bring that to the attention of the court that the effort has been made in the past. The other thing, of course, is that it's really not going to do you any good at all to have the person attend his first AA meeting on the eve of uh, his conviction. Larry, let's uh, move on and talk about the driving prohibition order. I if an accused wants to appeal a conviction for impaired or over 80 or a related offense and a driving prohibition order has been made at trial, can the accused just keep on driving until his or her appeal is heard? Well, there's a, a real ethical uh, uh, question um, for appellate counsel, assuming that uh, appellate counsel is different than trial counsel. In many cases, uh, maybe not. 
too often in the past, Council believed that once um, a Notice of Appeal is filed and uh, taken to the Ministry of Transportation and Communications and the license is returned, that's enough. Uh, not at all. You're setting your client up uh, to, uh, for, a, for a drive disqualified. Um, in some cases, it's not a question of ethics. It's, it's uh, by inexperienced counsels, just, just negligence. So be aware of Section 259. Section 260 and Section 261 of the Criminal Code. You have the mandatory uh, prohibition, license prohibition upon conviction, uh, the proceedings uh, on making of the prohibition order in 260, and of course, uh, Section 261, together with the now new Rule 41, uh, provides for the application to stay the order of license prohibition uh, pending appeal, which is, of course is brought to a general division judge sitting as a summary conviction appeal judge, but understand something, and we'll get into it a little later, this is discretionary relief with the onus on you at all times uh, when you bring the application uh, to satisfy the judge that there is some basis, some reasonable basis for the appeal that it's not frivolous and that prohibition, uh, it is not necessary to obtain the prohibition uh, in the public interest and, it would, and in that way wouldn't uh, affect the confidence of the public in the enforcement administration of uh, the criminal law. And I can go into that a little later when I talk about the forms. Well, Hugh, it seems to me that there's a bit of a practical problem uh, here. We all know, those of us who do appellate work, that often clients come in uh, and tell us, oh, I just uh, had my trial counsel file a notice of appeal and he or she sent me down to the ministry and I got my driver's license back. And then as appellate counsel, you find out upon further questioning that it looks like there was also a driving prohibition order that was made. Um, what should defense counsel be doing in those circumstances if you've been approached to act on the appeal? Well, I think that you, you make a good point. You find out later that a prohibition has been made. Often you won't be told that, I suppose, by your client that the driving order, uh, the order for prohibition has been made. So you've got to make that inquiry first off. Make that inquiry whether or not the, there has been a an order for prohibition. The next thing that I would do would uh, be to go to an annotation, uh, an article written by uh, my colleague Rick Libman, reported at uh, 21 Motor Vehicle Report 2nd at page 287, which deals with applications for stay of prohibition orders. Um, and the third thing was I'd go to the annotated rules of criminal practice and turn to Rule 41 which uh, now gives the Summary Conviction Appeal Court the same power as the Court of Appeal to fashion uh, an order uh, staying the, the order of prohibition. Larry Hughes talked about Rule 41. Uh, on a Summary Conviction Appeal, what materials do Defense Counsel need to prepare in order to get a stay of a driving prohibition order, and who hears the application? Uh, as I said before, it's a, it's a General Division judge sitting as a Summary Conviction uh, appeal court judge for this uh, for this limited purpose. Um, he was mentioned Rule 41, 41.04 sub 1 and 41.04 sub 2 will set out the materials that you have to prepare. If you've never done it before, I suggest you read the rules and then phone up someone who has some precedence and just follow those and and uh, fill in the blanks. Um, uh, really, in your notice of application, well, let me go back bef bef before the rules. Um, uh, I used to have to phone up Stephen Price to get a copy of his affidavit because he basically uh, reviewed the case and put in all the errors of the judge and all it hinted subtly at his arguments to establish, to establish the, the reasonable grounds. But it's been made simpler now and um, it, it's, a, it's a more balanced way to go, a proper way to go. Uh, in your notice of application, which can be found in Form 1 right in, right in one of these texts that all of you should buy about the criminal proceedings rules. Um, uh, you uh, need, need to, in your, in your case, but put the information, uh, the notice of appeal, and if necessary, supplementary notice of appeal, although I doubt you'll get to the supplementary notice of appeal if you want to move quickly to get the license back. The affidavit of your client and any other material. That any other material is very important. There, there's no limit to what you can do. Uh, if you're going to show hardship, um, uh, you may put in a letter from the employer talking about the good service and how of the uh, previous good service of the um, employee and how he has his job and how it's necessary that he drives for his job and he's, a, he's a, an important part of uh, the corporation. Or um, uh, if we're dealing with uh, uh, the question of treatment, of course you can have letters from the appropriate agencies 
in that respect. On the affidavit of your client, you don't have to talk about the errors of law. You may hint at them, but you talk about the particulars of the offense and make sure you include the results of the breath analysis or blood analyses. Um, the court uh, wants the driving record, the criminal record, um, uh, residence as, uh, for the last three years, uh, employment uh, history, etc. cetera, um, what the hardship is. And I, I've always had some trouble with this, but uh, you have to put in a statement as to whether or not the person is addic addicted and whether treatment is taken. Well, a lot of people don't accept or don't understand that uh, they need it. Um, that's quite an admission to make the court, it would seem to me. I suppose one way around it is to is for the applicant to say that, uh, um, and assuming he's going this way, is that, that while I'm talking about first offenders now, not the obvious uh, alcoholics, that um, the, the fact of a, an alcoholic problem wasn't considered, but this has woken him up to the possibility, and as a result, he's taking these steps. So you still keep a semblance of privacy on that issue. What's important to know in the, in, with, with the first offenders where, where there's no real aggravating features is, is these rules um, very happily provide uh, for consent in writing. In other words, you provide the Crown with materials, speak to the Crown, and if the, the Crown feels that uh, any judge or most judges would, would allow the application, the whole procedure uh, if properly done, can be done by consent. My only concern is, is that, is that, uh, because of the uh, approach of government uh, in, uh, in having the effect of chilling the discretion of crowns, and because of the rise of the drinking and driving lobby groups, uh, most crowns, and perhaps, and this isn't meant as criticism, uh, most young crowns may be afraid to adopt the consent and writing approach and want a judge to decide that issue. So just be aware of that. And Larry, do we have to go to the judge who's actually going to hear the appeal, or can we go to any general any, division any judge? Any judge of the general division. Hugh, does it make any difference if we're at the stage where the appeal is to the Court of Appeal? Yeah, the most practical difference is that the uh, code contemplates that a, a judge, or the court being appealed to, can direct the stay. And in the case of the Court of Appeal, that has been interpreted as meeting a panel of three. And uh, therefore, uh, you might well considered just as a practical matter, since you probably already have your factums and uh, you have the transcripts and so on, is just asking the court to expedite the appeal and have both matters dealt with it, well, waiving the, uh, the application for uh, uh, an order staying and uh, actually have the appeal itself expedited, because you do have to go to a panel of three, and to get a panel of three is going to take you some time. And I think most um, appellate counsel will tell you that these days it's pretty hard to get the Court of Appeal to stay a driving prohibition order. So following up on that, Larry. Can, can I, uh, I just wanted to add something. When you're preparing your materials on the application um, to stay the order, the annotations uh, tell us that, that there are some considerations you're going to have to answer, um, uh, particularly if you start off with uh, not necessarily an overwhelming or meritorious ground of appeal. Uh, if, if there are the following problems you have, the seriousness of the charge, the indicia of intoxication being high, the background of the appellant, which may include the Highway Traffic Act and criminal, criminal code uh, 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 offenses, uh, uh, prob uh, factors that would indicate the possibility of reoccurrence, alcoholism, uh, a second offense on bail for the same thing, a uh, history of uh, abuse, drug or alcohol abuse, um, a Highway Traffic Act record which, which raises doubts about the driver's responsibility to assert his privilege to drive, and addiction, as I said. You may have to be prepared to, uh, to answer those in the affidavit. You may have to delay your, your application somewhat until tangible evidence can be put before the court that would uh, relieve the judge of the discomfort. Uh, of, of giving a license back to someone who may put the public at risk. So, Larry, from a practical standpoint, in what kind of situations would you go ahead and encourage your client to spend his or her money to send you off to the Court of Appeal to try to get a stay of a prohibition order? As David Humphrey said earlier, I'll expand upon that if it's a, it's a private client in all cases. Um, but uh, seriously, uh, when you're dealing with a simple case of a first offender, um, an arguable ground of appeal and the necessity for the license to come back, 
then you would go ahead. Even in that case, if, if you're really stretching your grounds of appeal, you may want to discuss with your client this possibility. Um, it's arguable. I don't have a lot of confidence in it. The majority of authorities are against us. Uh, why not, uh, let, why not uh, leave the situation as it is without your license and I will attempt or make my best efforts to expedite the appeal. And that way you don't lose those three, four, five months of suspension that you'll get perhaps at a more inopportune time later on. The, the real problem is, is, uh, is the, the class of offender that I, uh, that I just mentioned. Um, second offender or, or worse, um, Highway Traffic Act record, criminal record, alcoholic, high reading, bad facts. Not necessarily all of those uh, cases. Um, you better have um, a, a, a ground of appeal that has some merit. It was interesting uh, that I was listening to Gail Dobney, who's now saying that the appellate courts are more, more open to looking behind the uh, simple um, um, uh, judgment of a court that says, uh, I've, um, I've observed the demeanor of the witnesses and I accept this evidence as opposed to that evidence, and there will be a, a conviction. Uh, wh whereas the court's going to now look at conflicting evidence in any possibility for uh, support of the accused evidence, even if tenuous. Um, so that's, that's a positive sign. But again, what I would suggest um, is delaying as long as you can um, the application, even if there's hardship. In other words, in other words, uh, the potential loss of job or a family dependent upon on the driving ability of the accused. Um, to deal with the issues in the way that we discussed earlier, um, find out and establish if there's a stable family behind the person, get, get involved with treatment, um, get documentary evidence of previous attempts at treatment if there's an alcoholic problem. Um, something that I do, and it's not meant uh, to be cynical about the process, uh, because there's a number of accused who just don't know what to do, but I, I say to the person, if you really feel remorse and you want to show a judge that you want to make steps to change, I sometimes look for community <coughs> service uh, prior to getting to trial, aside from treatment. Uh, I've, try, I've tried and successfully have placed people working in hospitals or in rehabilitation centers, which, which has a nexus to, to the situation where there's consequences for in, impaired driving um, uh, affecting society by way of accidents or, or, or uh, bodily harm uh, uh, to, to the victims. Uh, and um, uh, uh, get, I, I, I collect letters of support to show that this is aberrant conduct and this person has the potential to uh, reform. Um, uh, of course, if intermittent uh, driving licenses come back, that would be a big plus. It would help the judges at both levels, at the appellate level and at the provincial court level. And finally, if the person is of good character, I, I'm not too, sh too embarrassed to ask the person and then uh, put in the affidavit the fact that uh, if the license is brought back because of the great need for the license and you set out the reasons, the person in the affidavit undertakes to drive only for, uh, for employment purposes. Okay. I think Rick's going to bring out the big white hook, so um, we've used all our time and I'll bring it to a close. Thank you. Larry, we're on a lunch break until uh, 1.45. I'd ask that uh, you be back promptly for the afternoon session. We're going to have the replacement uh, alert machine and the new um, fangled intoxilizer with a demonstration and a couple of uh, toxicologists on our panel. We're also going to um, try to allow to leave a, a question period at, at the end so you'll have an opportunity to uh, ask questions from the floor. So if you can all be back promptly for 145.